Welcome everyone to this evening of poetry recitals. Um, this is an evening to launch this wonderful book by the charming Patmai Jaz. And uh, we're very grateful for the Arts Council uh, to give us this space to launch. And I would like uh, Emma Shah to say a few words. Thank you, Uri. Bhati Zabardast ek book hai Fatma ki aur main to pehle ne itna nahi janta tha lekin ek roz Amir Hussain ke saath inka dialogue tha aur phir ye book maine dekhi. So it's amazing. Aur phir itne shandar log jab jama hue hain iski recitation ke liye to mujhe aur bhi andaza hua ki ye kitni important hai kitab hai ye. Balki main to Salman se keh raha tha ki agar aap isko Urdu mein translate kar de. क्योंकि सलमान अंग्रेजी में भी लिखते हैं उर्दू में भी लिखते हैं तो मैं तो बहुत शुक्रगुजार हूं आर्ट्स काउंसिल की तरफ से खालिद अहमद साहब का सलमान हुरी नूरानी शमा अस्करी फवाद खान और इट्स एन ऑनर फॉर आर्ट्स काउंसिल एंड इट्स एन ऑनर फॉर मी कि ये हम कर रहे हैं एंड थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू शाह साहब सो ऑफकोर्स वी बिगिन विथ द पोइट हर सेल्फ Fatma Ijaz teaches English and speech at the Institute of Business Administration. She has studied English at Hartwick College, USA, York University, Canada, and Eastern Michigan University, USA. Her poetry has been published in numerous publications, including the Aleph Review, Ideas in Future, and Bombay Review. She was a reader at KLF 2020 and 2021. She has also written on culture and literature in Nayador, The Friday Times, and Dawn. Her book, The Shade of Longing and Other Poems, has recently been published by the Little Book Company, both as an e-book and a print edition. And of course, we would like to acknowledge Maniza Nakvi of the um, Little Book Company. Um, Fatma, yes. so uh, let's start by talking a little about the book itself. Mm -hmm. It's um, its structure, how, uh, how did it come about? Were these poems uh, written at a certain period of time in your life, or do, is this a collection of poetry written over, over the years? And um, how did you structurally put these poems together? Um, the, the story of this book is that it took around one and a half year to compile all the poems, but I was going through a phase in which I was accessing lost times, memories, things of the past, things that we don't um, go back into or look at for a long, long time, but it is either like a Pandora's box or a treasure box, but um, I wanted to access all of those things and it just, it just hit me like a fever or like, and intoxication, and once it started, it did not stop. It was, I know it was for a long time, but it was back of my mind constantly, and it was, and the poems just kept flowing, and there was a continuous element uh, to it. Uh, so the chapters, they came in the, in the successive order as it's compiled in the book. I want to read a small paragraph from the preface that you've written. Sure. Um, the contemplation of the past involves an evocative presence of a surreal present. You are but transformed into reliving a time that simply does not exist anymore. In doing so, you are in a heightened state of present past, a double consciousness that is more than the sum equal of its parts. It hovers into the unknown and even becomes a new kind of state, neither past nor present, but akin to an alternate universe. So as we um, go through the recitals and as we talk with Fatma and everyone, we will see that um, memory is a recurring theme in her poems. And uh, of course, with memory comes nostalgia uh, and uh, you know, uh, good memories, bad memories, memories of places, memories of people. So it's a, it's, it's a very interesting journey that Thank we're you. going to go into. Um, I think we will start with uh, Khalid Saab. Khalid Ahmed studied theater in the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Upon his return to Pakistan, he devoted himself to the performing arts. Since then, his contribution to theater and television drama has been immense. 
He also has a long experience of actor training and is presently the head Dramatic Studies National Academy of Performing Arts. Over to you, Khaled. Thank you, Guru. So, um, the poem I'm going to be reading is entitled Vodka, a subject close to my heart. <laughs> and uh, right at the end of the poem, there are footnotes which are descriptions of the characters. I would like to call it a play. Um, <clears throat> an abstract play, maybe, but definitely a play. Um, so I suggested to Fatma that maybe I should first read the uh, footnotes, which has a description of the two characters in the play, and then read uh, the poem itself because usually when you read a play, the characters are introduced at the beginning of the play. So Fatma said, it's fine, I could do that. <clears throat> so footnotes, you. Seen from a distance, man, intellectual, sober, quiet, rude, political, woman, Thoughtless, serious, moody, friendly. Closer glance, man, situational sarcasm, bold ambiguity, private mercy, strong language. Woman, supernatural beliefs, fierce, shocked, a little high, a little high. Closer still, Man, silent, calculated, cold, bitter. Woman, perplexed, at a loss of words, heart is breaking. Then the ounce of moon dipped in vodka, stirred with a candle, noticed the distaste the anxious stare of the woman at an identity thrown at her. She wears it all the same, like a discarded robe, it hides her intestines and soul. It begins again, the ounce of vodka in the moon, stirring in the candle flame dipped in water, the hurried glance of the woman as she acts out her given script. Sometimes she listlessly draws the moon on an old significant now card. The circle is not perfect. It bothers her. She starts again. Sometimes she picks up her pen and stares into the unknown. It is a glance out her window, the only significant moment of the night. As she gazes out at the street, the scent of no-name flowers trace her eyes. She thinks of what had happened that night, the vodka pouring into the moon, the drawing growing blurry and wet and edges all torn. She had noticed the merciless stare of a man who gave a different name to the night. Let's begin again. The vodka interfered with the moon that night and would not let her draw in peace. There was the incessant humming of a bad breath which tuned out the drink. The drunken stare of a man bothered her. As the night let the moon wander alone on the street, what a difference from scene one, when the irritant was 
as yet unnamed. Scene two was a scene two was a little vague, as if meaning had become complex just by being. The stairs led to a room where dogs barked. This detail bled onto the scene when she reopened her drawing. She easily marked as circle. Philosophy classrooms dictated that no circle was perfect. It was a late hour. The circling moon had found its way to Watka stairs and ran across the room now flooded. The man and woman were trying to swim, but it seemed they were floating. The frantic eyes of the woman tried to reach out to the man, but he was drowning in vodka. His hands were missing. The water had stolen his soul. A dark night. Something of the night lingered into the moon. The vodka was duality. One half, dis one half displaced and one half displayed an evil talisman, the other a half woman, half moon. Desperate incantations ran in no name flowers. The scatter was real. The dogs barked in upstairs rooms. When the dogs entered the room, the vodka was on the table. In the spill of what followed, there was an uncanny acceptance. The woman belonged to the aristocracy, but on this night, she was with this man alone. The dogs barked, the vodka spilled, the moon followed, then the trees. Then the entire night toppled into the room. The remains of the man and woman were never found. Vodka, interference, radio moon, a woman sick at heart, a hurting room, the man perfectly still. The man has eyes of marbles and lips of doom. Moon in the glass instead, served on ice, carried along like a bag of deceit in an artificial world. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, you know, when I uh, was told that you would be reading this poem, it made perfect sense to me. As you said, this is theater. It has all the ingredients. It has the characters. It has the scenes. It has drama. Um, so of course, who, what else would you choose being a theater person? But um, what, what else in the theme of this poem made you attracted you towards it and made they want to recite this particular poem? Was it just the theater aspect or was there, uh, was there other things? It's very poetic and uh, beautiful phrases, words, imagery, and uh, you can't decide whether what is being said is um, real hmm. or imagined or poetry. Um, it also reads like a real story about a relationship between a man and a woman, a woman's acceptance of her um, status in a society the man being the man, etc. And I think it flows beautifully. I, in fact, I would perhaps have to read it a number of times more 
before I could really absorb it and enjoy it more and perhaps read it better. <laughs> it, you know, it reminded me of a movie, I think it was a movie by Karastami, in which there's, again, there's a man and a woman, and to the end, you can't really tell whether, whether they were in a relationship, whether they are in a relationship, whether they're husband and wife, or mm -hmm. just, you know, strangers, or they know each other. It was a, I don't remember the name, but it was, it, this poem really reminded me of that. Um, Fatma, what, what would you say? I mean, this is such a, in some ways, it's such a dark poem. What occurred here? What happened in this night? Something infernal, dark, mysterious. Yes, um, well, thank you for the reading, and this is really a very special moment for me. Um, this poem, it's about a man and a woman, and they are alone, but are they? Um, Wallace Stevens, there's a line, a man and a woman and a blackbird are one. And I feel, as you said, that there is some dark presence inside, buried inside this relationship between, between these two. Um, and of course, the gender construct is there. Um, if, if, um, if the woman feels misunderstood, or if the woman feels that um, she acts, she's acting out a given script, or um, she is acting out an identity thrown at her, um, what is the man doing in that? But I feel they are both drawn into the dark labyrinth because the man too loses his, uh, is drowning, um, his hands are missing, his, his soul is shaken. So something, and I feel that the idea of mystery, we connote something benign with it. But there, there are also mysteries that are dark, that, that are um, at a dark time. And this is, as you said, a night poem. And it's, um, the spell is, is like that of this poem. Why the title Vodka? Does it vodka because um, A, it's an altered state of mind. It's an altered, it's, it's a high state of mind. As, as um, Khalid said, that uh, it is um, perhaps not real. So when you are in an altered state of mind, is what is happening, is it real, is it unreal? Is it just intoxication? Are you just imagining it? Is it really even happening? Um, so, and also worldly connotations, uh, even though it's a high state, there's a cultural connotation that it's a vice, that it's something bad, that perhaps this woman is, is not of a good uh, character, um, because on this night she is with this man alone. So I'm raising the question that is it just the presence of being in a room with a man late at night, um, how does society or culture perceive that? Mm. It Im immediately makes her, and with the title, uh, Vodka, it gives, gives her a connotation which raises the question of her character. And right. I wanted to... Right, the bad uh, woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the symbolism of the perfect circle? The perfect circle, um, because this man has affected her um, identity. It's a negative gaze that has been thrown at her. And sometimes I feel that a negative gaze or a, 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 a negative opinion of you uh, in an immediate environment can affect you. Even if it's not mm -hmm. true, even if you know it's not true, it's going to have an immediate physical impact uh, on you. So it's affected her creativity. It's affected her ability right. to draw um, uh, perfect circle, such a simple thing as a circle, and she's not able to, to do that. Wonderful. It's a beautiful poem. Thank beautiful you. Beautiful poem. Uh -huh. And with that. Yes. Yes, thank you so sure. much. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you. Moving on, um, Pirzada Salman. Mohammed Salman is a Karachi based journalist. He's a bilingual poet, Urdu and English, and also dabbles in fiction. He did his MA in English Literature from the University of Karachi in 1992-93. His collection of English poems, Bemused, was published in 2017, followed by a collection of Urdu poems, Vakht, in 2018. He writes under the pen name Pirzada Salman. Salman. Thank you. <clears throat> so I've picked two pieces. 
The first one is called The Night Watchman. I imagined a shadow on the night watchman, a whistling on his collarbone, a wicked wish in his pocket. He waited an hour or two in the partial moon trying to discover my secret that ran past the midnight into an unearthliness. Finally, giving up, he walked to his usual post. I sighed with the relief of a thief. The other one is called The Painter. The words finally came, like wounds on brittle branches climbing the waned glass of memory, cracking against the brutal sun. The stubborn flower grew out of this monstrosity. The Egyptian spell pervaded in the dream. The dancing didn't stop till doom. Scent of dried roses confirmed the labyrinth of laughter, now drifting, now dreamt. I whispered close to the creeping clock, steady, steady, and so it stood still, all of it, and I could paint, paint, paint. Wonderful. It's wonderful that all the people reciting today are also theater actors, Pirzada Salman not being me, the me, last not. one to enter the field. Um, would you like to talk about uh, your choice of poems? Why not? Um, the fundamental difference between a piece of prose and a work of poetry is rhythm, beat, the rhythmic flow. They say every great novel has moments of poetry in it, which means if a poet is able to move or sway the reader with the rhythm of his poem, his or her poem, there's nothing like it. And Fatma's poems are beautiful. They have this beautiful rhythmic flow, the arrangement of words. Poetry is all about the arrangement of words. I, I really love uh, what T.S. Eliot once said, and I've often quoted this, and my friends are sick of me. I, I quote it all the time. It's, Eliot once said, poetry communicates before it is understood. So that's communication, that particular communication happens because of the rhythm of the poem. As far as content is concerned, the subject matter, we all know Fatma writes about memory. For her, uh, I think memory is not a bucket full of ashes. It stays with her, it's things that have stayed with her for a long, long time. And the metaphor that she uses to put that across is that of the moon. You'll find the reference of the moon in numerous poems. Now moon, the moon, uh, obviously has, it's a very romantic metaphor. It's to do with our inner selves. But at the same time, it's also to do with the cosmos, with our fate, with destiny. So whenever I read Fatma and the reference of the moon in her poetry, it reminds me of a Faz Ahmed Faz poem, Zinda Ki Ek Sham. Mm -hmm. um, Jalwagahe Vishal ki shame, wo bujha bhi chuke agar to kya, chan ko gul kare to hum jaan. Bilkul, bilkul. So, um, yes, you're right. There are beautiful metaphors in her poetry. The, I was talking to Fatma and I said, you know, um, I see colors um, repetitively used and maybe Black and white is not a color, but there is a lot of white in your poems, as in blank spaces and liking to be in, sometimes in that blank space, wanting to fill it. There's a lot of, obviously, dark and night and black. And there's also blue. And we will talk about the blue when we come to the poem that yes. has a lot of blue in it. Um, so the night watchman, it almost seems like something that you lived, that happened, is that so? It is, it is actually, in fact. Um, um, you know, as a woman in Pakistan, in Karachi, we cannot go for late night strolls, you know, in a, at a late, late hour. But you can go to your terrace. 
And um, so I was like at 3 or 4 a.m. Um, at my terrace, and there's, there was just me, and there was the presence of the night watchman um, on the street uh, ahead in, uh, below. And, um, you know, it's like with poetry, the fun part is you say one thing, you mean another, you imply a third. And so the lit on the literal realm, it is, it is that, uh, you know, that you almost feel, as a woman, you almost feel like a thief in the night mm -hmm. because you're not supposed to be there. It's, it's something, it's kind of restricted and alone, you know, it's, it's, it's like that. But it just got me thinking um, about um, what he's thinking and, uh, and at the same time, there's a shadow on the night watchman. So then it became, um, as I said, an imaginative uh, leap as well as to um, forbidden times, secrets, and this want to be known, this want to be understood, but at the same time, you don't want to be understood. So yeah, there is a quickness. A, there's an almost feeling of uh, wanting to be discovered and yet not. Yes. Being seen. Yes. Exactly. There's a quickness of heartbeat, and then, but then I, I I feel that every one of us is a complex being, and it's not really possible to know anyone entirely. I, I believe that. So I think we're safe on that. No one can really ever know you right. entirely. So exactly. yeah. And then of course the painter. Now the painter is literally what the whole book is about. It's the theme of memory. Yes. And it's sort of, um, this is thematic for, the, for your whole book, this poem. Yes. Um, so um, what, uh, how would you interpret it? Why the paint, why did you use the painter as, you know, um, and not the poet? Well, I think that two of the um, practices that fascinate me the most, Huri, are um, art, an artist, and a music composer because it's something, it's a mystery I don't understand. You know, it's, I cannot figure it out and it, it has always, it's been so compelling. So it's a dedication to the painter and to the, to the fascinating world that I imagine the painter to have in her or his mind. And, um, and as you said, it's thematic for the whole book, I agree, because the words finally came. You know, sometimes there's an experience that you cannot put to words and it's been years, but you cannot even say it to yourself, and you cannot express it. But one fine day, the words finally come, and this book is, is like that. Time um, stands still. Yes, time stands still, and, you, and paint. you can paint and paint yes. and paint. Beautiful, lovely. Coming to our Kulsum. Uh, so, um, Kulsum Aftab is a dramatist, poet, actor, original content creator, director, translator, voiceover artist, script consultant, writing and acting coach, student counselor, and uh, at Napa faculty. Kulsum is an activist for meaningful entertainment, female empowerment, and original content. Her work includes award-winning documentary, R. Jacob, Urdu translation of Stanislavski's An Actor Prepares, and uh, she has also given a, a voiceover uh, in Three Bahadur, Teen Bahadur. Teen Bahadur, first Pakistan animated movie, and played the lead in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Kulsum. Thank you. Two poems by Fatima really appealed me. Symbiotic, wrath and desire. I scotch whiskey, patch it blue, darling, signifier smokes. Let the signified be unannounced, a stranger at a cafe. Marble eye, make believe, scream. Scream to make significant the insignificant. Not so bad, a Moby Blue. Lightning strikes. Earth knows my name, even if you saw, you don't. Blue Inca God. I squint to your sunless day. Let's start a revolution, evolve, arouse. 
eternal damnation of the cursed daughter of Lucifer. She's a sparkling angel underneath. Undress, please. The second one is uh, the perfect song. Your casual deafens the total heart, turning it to mute, perhaps your bitter blue. Pit off the telephone in perplexity. Count the seconds till it turns true. I shouldn't have trusted you. But you behave the way dark ways to do to dolphin, keeping, keeping. Thanks. Kulsum, I had this incredible urge to ask you to perform the poems. <laughs> that was you know, the idea. <laughs> I wish you had. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about, how do you experience these poems? How do you feel about them? Uh, you know, what, what uh, made you want to recite these poems? Um, I think when it was uh, the selection of both of the poems, uh, we did it together um, and it was like um, as if she was saying do you think it is going to be the right poem for you and I was saying it is the right poem for me at the same time and that's how I think I would like to define my connection with the poem and my connection with the poet uh, the friendship and the bonding and the, the whole flow of as yes Pirzada said the rhythm that's, that's the thing what in the first wave appeals me. And then, yeah, it's like you just uh, talking to the gods of this, this whole power structure of the society and trying to address that whatever you think, if there is a sunless day, let's, let's talk it out. Let's, let's see what can we do about it. So it, it that was my connection with, the, with this particular poem, the first one. Mm. Uh, um, about the perfect song, how did you feel reciting it? Was it different from reading it? It was. In fact, as, as, uh, I'm, my whole learning process as an actor was, uh, was uh, the concept of physical action uh, by Stanislavski was very helpful for me throughout. So when I read that poem, and there was that physical action in this, and I just could not, I still actually really, it was like I felt like jumping there and started <laughs> doing that the way I, I, I wanted to scream in the middle, as if uh, uh, when she just says it, you know, the seconds count. There is a silence, and that silence in the poem is actually the, when it comes to the sensibility, it's a scream for me. So the way I had uh, um, planned it to perform was actually, it could have had a scream from me. And that, this, this second one has that emotional, the way you are just like uh, memories, the aspect of trauma, where you just, nothing, ha actually something happened for others, but for you it happens every day. And this poem says, it is happening to you right now, when you read it. So you feel it, all the sensation. And I literally felt I just want to perform it right now. <laughs> Lovely. Fatma, coming to the symbiotic, yes. um, what was the inspiration behind this poem and how does the title play into it? Um, Wrath and desire. Um, I feel that they are both very primal, earthy feelings, something Dionysian about it, of the earth, of the roots, of uh, 
um, of passion and um, and and what would happen if if you are feeling both of these things at the same time in an interdependent relationship, and how would that how would that play out? I wanted to uh, experiment with that, and at the same time, the mention of um, blue Inca god and the primitive uh, gods. Um, pagan, it, how earth is so important over there, how even a stone is important, how uh, lightning is important, and how it can symbolize the wrath. And um, I wanted to see what would happen if these two were to come together. What is the connotation of the signifier and the signified uh, terms which are not easily understood yes, by the layman. Yes, it's, it's, it's a little bit about my linguistics yeah. um, degree there. <laughs> but the signifier, um, what appears to be, yeah. and uh, the signified, uh, what it is inside. And th uh, what appears to be is perhaps a woman smoking, signifier smokes. And uh, signified is unannounced, a stranger at a cafe. So there is, you cannot understand what the woman is uh, really feeling, or she might be feeling all of this wrath and desire, but at the at the front of it, the signifier, she is just smoking. So, and how does Lucifer play into this? Uh, Lucifer, um, the first betrayal, um, the brightest angel, and this is the daughter of um, Lucifer. And before the wrath and the desire hit um, Lucifer. Uh, can we ever go back to that uh, space before it happened? Um, and, and that would, if you undress Lucifer, it would be a sparkling angel underneath. Mm. So I just wanted to play, and a little play on that as well. Mm. Yes. And of course, the second poem, The Perfect Song. Yes. Um, there's a certain loss of three senses um, in The Perfect Song. Um, can you speak about this? Yes. Um, the perfect song starts with your casual deafens the total heart. And uh, I feel that the casual narrative, you know, when people say um, life happens, we move on, friendships break down, um, love ends, and it's, it's so casual. It's, it's just, it happens, it's ordinary. But what about to the person who's rooted, who is intense, who cannot just move on? It's not that casual. And um, so I feel that there is a deafness of the heart, it turns to mute, and, and the dolphin, the sense of touch that the water, the, the waves were keeping, keeping, it's um, so close, and now you're saying that, um, you know, the news of betrayal, uh, so how do you, how do you as, as, um, fathom that information, how do you take that in, what do you do with it? Bitter blue. Bitter blue, yes, <laughs> blue is there. Lovely. Okay, shall we move on to Fawad? Fawad Khan graduated from the National Academy of Performing Arts, majoring in direction for stage in the year 2008. Since then, he has been consistently doing theater. He has not only been directing, but acting and writing as well. Some of the major productions he has been part of include Waiting for Godot, Six Characters in Search of an Author, Khe Lek Raat Ka, Khoya Hua Admi by Kamal Ahmed Rizvi, and Chup, a play that he wrote himself. What attracted him to Dastan Goyi was his love for the simple art of storytelling and classical Urdu literature. Fawad. Um, I've chosen three poems. So the first one is Old Familiars. The older the feeling, the more it is accustomed to constant revisions, ruinations. Perhaps because it is a wound that has outgrown its stay and now has the tentacles of ants that have no intention of leaving. In fact, akin to recurring memories, it can entice the lizard on the yellow wall whose eyes are glazed and lashless. It is even closer to you than the immediacy of gadgets. It casually walks on the streets inside your mind, which in themselves are complex bridge work. You shake your head, trying to rid yourself of it, hoping it would fall off. But it's an internal lice system 
that has invaded you. But when you become confrontational, direct, rising up like a snake in fury and scorpion, sting yourself, you simultaneously attempt to kill it and yourself. Hence, for the first time, it is afraid of you. <laughs> now you acquire the subtle madness of taming it, tantalizing it with cheese, snapping shut its writhing body till it calls you master. Thank you. The second one is uh, now. I guess the time is now, for when was it ever before or after? Perpetual mint follows me wherever I go. Perhaps the time is now, for when was it ever before? For when was it before? I don't remember. But the way you're looking at me, I think you do. Time now is like time before or after. Who has a clue? But if it is now, don't let it be sudden or too soon. And not too late either. For time now is persistent the way red-eyed rabbits are. Carrot, carrot cold. You should be more bold. But, beautifully said, I didn't ever say or before. Time present is now more than time before. Mm -hmm. And the last one is what I like. Sometimes I take to the page without a thought or a care. Without words even, I just take to it like paper balanced between silver salt and pe pepper shakers. The sea at its most pious and pristine. Therefore, I like white spaces and the silence of energy exchange. That's it. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fawad, I will ask you the same question that I've been putting to each one of you. What attracted you to these poems? Um, the, well, Old Familiars is basically about old memories and old memories that are not willing to leave you, be old wounds that are not easily healed. And um, I think <laughs> the way it talks about it, uh, how a wound that has outgrown its stay, it just, um, I, I just thought it was very beautifully written and how when you confront it and how you deal with them and how uh, old wounds, it's about dealing with old wounds and it just attracted me. That's the simple reason why I, I picked this one up. The second one was um, Now. Now seemed like a kind of a romantic poem to me. It almost is, sounds like an invitation. There's something, something magical about this moment that is now and then something needs to be done about this and if it needs to be done it should not be done too soon too suddenly I mean there's a um, uh, how should I say it feels like the moment is now it is being realized but it's also it's it's something that is really important something something alive something uh, for, for which you could be excited about as well And it also makes you think about time, <laughs> uh, how, how, how the whole future and past and everything is, is contained in this, in this particular moment of now and uh, all the memories perhaps also contained in this moment. So yeah. And the third little one. The third one is, uh, one. well, it's, uh, it's about a writer who likes to go to an empty page. I dread it personally as a writer. But also, uh, an empty page uh, is, uh, is full of possibilities. It's, mm. it's, it's where, um, where m 
it's like silence that is that is also extremely meaningful and at the same time um, i mean the moment you say something the moment you put something in words it gets locked up it 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 there is a certain amount of um, blocking that you do like i um so for example if you if you show an image there is an image and you can't think beyond an image same goes with words when you use a word you use only the connotations connected with that word but with silence it's it's <laughs> endless like the sea right um thank you um so um the pro you know the the um, the poem now i will start with that fatma mm -hmm. because that sort of resonated with me being a procrastinator mm -hmm. <laughs> why i mean what is this um, um, why this procrastination what is really the right timing um yes you're right it's it's an invitation um to the procrastinator um to from a realm of pre language and um pure experience to actually break that and come into language and right at the end the word the first word but uh it's to break the status quo and it's inviting the procrastinator to break that status quo uh and use his or her voice to um to speak um so yes uh, as fawad said uh it is it is kind of allure um uh, seductive in the way it is appealing to the procrastinator it's it's also it it it's a poem that has as salman said uh, it has so much rhythm in it it really it pulls you um and then the last poem uh, that he read um, this whole uh, thought of blank spaces and filling blank spaces and maybe white noise yes uh, the white um of the of i mean the poet uh, as fawad said the writer and even the poet the first thing we confront is the blankness of the paper and what is our relationship to the sheer physicality because you're coming from a realm of words and ideas and imagination and here it here is the physicality of it and you want to enter into it and you want to reach into it to, to the very sea of it it's it's untouched uh, unknown unexplored and at the same time it's inviting it's uh, the blank space is inviting um and it, and at the same time it uh, at the end it's like a direct experience with a person as well before language is also like a white space of silent energy and communication mm. and then old familiars now it's interesting that uh, fawad was the only one who chose a poem from the first part yes. of your book yes. memory and this is where i'd like you to tell us more uh, in more detail about how the book is structured yes um it is the first two uh, chapters are memory book 1 and memory book 2 um and in these these are drowning and um into um, submersive into the experience of memories not really holding uh, on letting myself go and experience whether intoxicating whether despair whether an old wound or whether uh, an old love um but then when you come out of that experience and you have to be in the world and be part of the world so the next chapter is uh, berserk which is not here not there and you don't know what has really happened and how you experience this this feeling of having lived all of that again um so you turn into a skeptic you don't that's the next chapter and you don't you kind of are a bit um reality for you is not the same anymore and then i think closure is very important um sometimes in life we don't get uh, the right closure uh, and wounds stay open um so i felt it was leave taking is all about giving that sense of closure to myself for all those memories and for the book as a structural element as well i found the use of the word berserk very interesting and also that um most of the poems that were chosen to be read today are from yes. that particular portion yes, of the poem and i hope everyone um, gets to purchase the book 
uh, and uh, read all the poems because they're just fabulous. Coming to closure, um, we come to Shama, and she's going to read two of my favorite poems. I'm so happy that she chose these poems. And they do, uh, um, I, I, I thought of having her in the end because they do sort of, uh, even though the first poem is not from the chapter closure, but they both sort of signify a closure. Shama, um, let me introduce you first. Shama Askari has been associated with the performing arts for the last 20 years. She started her acting career in theatre in 1999 with Tariq Iniswa and then moved on to television, film and dramatised readings. She has travelled and performed all over Pakistan as well as India. She is currently working with the other festival, Pakistan. Shama, over to you. Thank you, Huri. Thank you, Fatma. So, of Huri and my favorite poems. This is called The Right Poem. Right. Blue spherical mist. I wasn't the right fit. That makes me a misfit, right? You haven't tried absinthe before. It tastes of licorice and furor, a bit of pride and some madness. You remind. There is a court that cuts if you play it right, right? Would you like to offer me a stage so I can say it right? Misfit eyes. Monsoon heights crashing come like rain in the night. Hours long rumination between you and I. A silence that pierces the moon to cries. Do you remember? No, you don't. Right. Sometimes a ship sails at the deep. It is solitary like the waves. You can see it now. But you haven't ever before. Perhaps you, know, perhaps you had no eyes for it. Who knows? Can you kiss under the sun, or does it burn with its light? There's no way home, you said, right? I may be wrong, but good thing is you're always right. Must feel good all night. I'll scatter away the ashes of you in a night so blue, so blue. And from heaven up above, you'd say, right? Like you always did, I'll never apologize. That's what you said, right? Sixteen candles for a flame of a heart. You burnt brighter than all that. Goodbye. Because we never said that, right? Right. Goodbye. The poem I'd like to read. I want to singly read a poem that slips off the page and leaves nothing but the white, blank brightness, sort of like mint halos you've swallowed. I want to feel a poem that can whiskey its way down to that forbidden alley in my mind. I want to spiral down from the night skies and land perfectly horizontal on a moving stillness of a lake in a blindness that knows no one. I want to be found by wild flowers in a forbidden caress. I'd like to take the chance and swallow the moon even if it gets stuck in my throat. And from here on, swan bright, I cut through the racing night. No one would be ever able to tell why the hurry. Maybe I'd like to follow you home and watch as you abandon the staircase and take to the grass outside and lay there for a while, wandering, waking, laughing, sleeping. Beautiful. Beautiful. Shama, right? What do you want to say? <laughs> right. Right is such a woman's poem. And I was telling Huri that, you know, uh, I understand fiction, but poetry is something I've always struggled with. I love the blank verse. And as an actor, I think when something resonates, it just works. And I can't explain it to anyone, but it just made such complete sense to me to be reading it. So the right poem is, I think, for, I think I, you should, we should dedicate it to every single woman we know. <laughs> and of course, the final one, which is the poem, uh, it's, just, it's just so brilliantly written. And uh, I, it, 
Again, Fatma, I think maybe you should explain it because for me, I just the, just the fact that you want to swallow the moon and it, and it doesn't matter if, it, matter if it gets stuck in your throat just says so much that um, I would love you to explain that. Yeah, so the recurring theme of the moon as someone yes, said. You know, um, you mentioned Maniza and the publisher of this book and when we were working at it and she said, um, I had a different title and she said that, you know, um, you know how many times you have spoken about the moon, it's this recurrent theme in your book and, and she mentioned, and she chose the shade of longing, she gave me a few options and then, so it, it always makes me think of her as well, uh, the moon and um, swallow, um, if, if the one that Fawad read, uh, what I like was about the writer, then this is about the reader and uh, this is the last poem in the book as well and I feel that I did not want the experience of poetry to end, you know, and whether it's uh, writing or reading, I want to stay in that world of, of poetry and uh, that altered height and that altered state of, of reading poetry. So this is, this is a reader and I want to um, be taken and uh, it should be like love and I should experience it uh, completely and be wholly, um, uh, submerged uh, in in that, um, and um, yeah, that's you also mentioned uh, when I spoke to you about these poems and wanting them to be read in the end that there is a dedication. Yes, um, the right poem, and um, um, I feel so close to Shama uh, right now just because of the experience of having your words read um, exactly the way I felt it, I felt. And um, in the right poem, my, um, uh, a teacher of mine uh, who I was very close to passed away. And uh, th the story goes, I was not in uh, um, upstate New York uh, where I was studying when I met him. And the story goes that I read about it in the news later on, and he had gone to uh, hiking in the mountains to scatter the ashes of a friend of his. And that's where he um, fell, and that's how he, he died. Um, so um, it's a dedication to him when, when, when as, as we're reading the right poem and nothing, it's, it's courting rejection and courting, um, you know, that kind of failure and just embracing it and that, and you know, when that moment when you, you think of that one person who used to understand, who used to, who used to know you in a way that nobody else ever did or, or could. Um, and he is the one who actually said to me uh, one day, never apologize. And I still think about those words, what it means, um, but he always said that, you know, keep your head high and never apologize. So, so the, the dedication in that, um, yes. Lovely. You know, I'd like to just, this was uh, so touching and moving, Fatma, what you just told us about your friend, um, that I just wanted to end on an anecdote because uh, when I quoted your poem on Facebook, and I was, and uh, a friend immediately called me and said, maybe you've misspelled the word, it must be whisk, not whiskey. <laughs> and I said, no, it is whiskey. And it makes perfect sense to me why it's whiskey. <laughs> so on that note, thank you so much everyone for being here. Thank and you. this book, uh, some copies are available over here but otherwise they can be bought at Liberty Books. They will also be available at the Karachi Literature Festival. And if you, uh, if you want, you can go on the website of the Little Book Company and uh, read the e-book. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you, all my...